Hi everyone and welcome to today's lecture, which is on microbial genetics and mutations. Honestly, this happens to be my personal favorite, even though I do understand that students are not always as crazy about genetics. And I do understand that for some of you, this may be uh, the first time or close to the first time that you're encountering some of these topics, even though technically in a course like microbiology, genetics is meant to be a review. So keep in mind that if there's anything that I don't go into enough detail with or that you don't understand the background for, please send me a message on Remind or email and I'll give you some extra review because again, I do know that this is the topic or the, the lecture that students do tend to have the most difficulty with, especially if you have not had any genetics course before. And I completely understand that. It is not your fault if you have any trouble with any of this. So please do reach out at any time. So the first thing that we're going to go over today is the general flow of genetic information. And there's a term that I want you to remember, which is the central dogma of biology. And in genetics, this central dogma of biology is DNA to RNA to protein, meaning DNA is transcribed into RNA during transcription, and then RNA is translated into protein during translation. Okay, so make sure that you write down DNA to RNA to protein as the central dogma, which includes transcription and translation all of which we're gonna cover in today's lecture. Now, before we really get into the different steps of this dogma and the exact details, I first wanna give you a couple of videos to help you basically visualize what's going on. Because I noticed that one of the most difficult things for people to grasp in genetics are these concepts of things that you don't actually get to see on a daily basis. Okay, so you can see that, oh yeah, you know, I look like this parent or this relative, you know, clearly genetics is at play, but you don't get to really see your DNA, your RNA, or your proteins. And so that makes it sometimes a little more difficult to understand or to visualize or even to be interested in honestly. So I kind of want to give you a few videos during today's lecture to help you picture what exactly is going on. And I do recommend you watching the videos a couple of times and going over this lecture a few times as well, because again, this is one of the tougher chapters or lectures to visualize. Whereas a lot of our other tap chapters that we'll cover will be, th be things that you really see on a daily basis and you see in the hospitals if you're doing any clinical work. In order to pass genetic information onto its offspring, an organism must make a copy of its DNA. The process of copying DNA is called DNA replication. During replication, each strand of the parental DNA serves as a template in the creation of new DNA. Because each newly synthesized DNA molecule is made up of one parental strand and one new strand, DNA replication is described as semi-conservative one strand in each molecule is conserved while the other strand is newly replicated. Okay, so that was the first video, which is a general overview video. And now we're going to go into a little more detail with the next video. And please keep in mind that today, any of the processes we go through, any enzymes that we start to talk about, which you're going to see in the next video, you have to be very comfortable knowing the names as well as the functions of all enzymes that we mentioned today. And please make sure to keep each of the processes separate because uh, one of the biggest things that I see happen with this chapter with students when it comes time for exams is that students tend to lose points by simply mixing up the different processes and accidentally not reading the question carefully or putting the wrong enzymes with the wrong process. 
Okay, so we're going to go into a little more detail now. In many organisms, the two DNA polymerases responsible for replicating the leading and lagging strands are linked together by connector proteins. To make this possible, cells take advantage of the flexibility of DNA. The leading strand is synthesized continuously toward the replication fork in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Since the leading strand is synthesized continuously, it only needs In many organisms, the two DNA polymerases responsible for replicating the leading and lagging strands are linked together by connector proteins. To make this possible, cells take advantage of the flexibility of DNA. The leading strand is synthesized continuously toward the replication fork in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Since the leading strand is synthesized continuously, it only needs one RNA primer to start the process. Since DNA so now, as you saw in the video, DNA replication is considered a semi-conservative replication. Okay, so ask yourself, what did they say that that means? Semi-conservative. So semi means partially. Conservative means you're keeping something the same. So in semi-conservative replication, if you look at the figure on the right here, you have a double-stranded parent DNA, and we're going to be making two copies from that single DNA. So what happens is the double strands on zip, and each of those original strands becomes a template, which is part of the new daughter strands. So each of these two daughter strands has one half of that original molecule which is why it's considered semi-conservative because it has kept some of the original molecule. Now, important question to ask yourself is when does a cell need to replicate its DNA? And I want you to put stars or circle or highlight this question because this you will see again. Think about it. When would a cell want to double all of the genes that it currently has? Well, before mitosis, before it splits, right? Because if that one cell is now going to become two cells, if it did not double its DNA first, then each of those cells would have how many genes? Only half, right? And every time a cell split or divided, each time it would end up with fewer and fewer of the DNA that it's supposed to have. So that's why every cell needs to replicate its DNA before cell division, before mitosis. And what we usually see that referred to as is S phase or synthesis phase of interphase in, in the cell cycle, okay? But the key thing to remember here is before mitosis, before cell division, okay? Now, like I mentioned before, what's really important when you go through any of these genetic processes is to really be comfortable with the enzymes involved. And if you know all of the enzymes and what they're doing, in what order that they're doing that, you then understand the process completely. So on this slide, I mapped out the various enzymes that are involved in DNA replication in the order that they're involved. So the first two that you see here are gyrase and helicase, okay? Gyrase and helicase. Gyrase, you may remember, we mentioned in lecture number one, and I said that it would come back. So gyrase, what that does is it on does the coiling of that DNA because remember you have that DNA all coiled up to become very tight and fit into the small cell. So now if you're going to replicate it, you need to first uncoil it. 
Okay, but it is still double stranded at this point. What then unzips or denatures it into single strands is helicase. Okay, so gyrase uncoiled the DNA. And now helicase unzips it or denatures it into single strands. Now, if a cell just unzipped that double-stranded DNA into two single strands, what's it naturally going to want to do? It's naturally going to want to stick back together, right? Because those are complement strands. They match each other. They stick together. So in order to prevent that sticking together or resealing of the double strands, what's called single-stranded binding protein will stick all along the single strands and coat those single strands so that they stay separated so that the primase and DNA polymerase can then take care of replication. Now we're going to go over the details of primase, DNA polymerase, RNASH, and ligase in the next slides. But so far, keep in mind, gyrase on coils, helicase then unzips to single strands, and SSB coats the single strands so that they don't stick back together. Then we get to our next enzymes. The next enzymes to think about are DNA polymerase and primase. Now, DNA polymerase, whenever you hear polymerase, Think of enzymes that build nucleic acids. So if it's a DNA polymerase, it builds or puts together DNA strands. If it's RNA polymerase, then it builds RNA. Now, DNA polymerase, it's gonna build DNA strands, but it's not all that great at its job. Okay. It has some limitations, specifically that it can only build in one direction, known as the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. That's simply how we, um, how we label DNA. So figure if you were to say that from the top to bottom of something, that's the same thing as saying from 5' prime to 3' prime. Okay? Now the other limitation that DNA polymerase has is it cannot start new strands. So it can't build a DNA strand from scratch. It needs to have what's called a three prime OH of a previous nucleotide to build off of, to stick the new base to, okay? So for instance, if you think of DNA, remember in lecture one we reviewed that DNA has a whole bunch of different nitrogen bases. They can be A, T, C, or G. So what we're saying here is you cannot have DNA polymerase start from scratch. It would need at least one A, T, G, or C to stick the next letter base to, okay? To build that strand. So, you have to ask yourself, well, what's necessary to compensate for these limitations? Because clearly, DNA polymerase builds new DNA, but how does it do that if it can't start from scratch? Well, what's needed is called primase, okay? Prime. Okay, so what's needed to correct for those limitations is primase, okay? So that's how you spell primase. Primase is an RNA polymerase, and as you can see in later slides, RNA polymerase is a rock star, okay? It is fantastic at its job, unlike DNA polymerase. So now, what primase is able to do is it makes a whole bunch of little RNA primers, which now can be the start site for DNA polymerase. Now, we're not going to go into all of the details involved in that process, but just be aware that when primase makes these little RNA primers as a start site for DNA polymerase, DNA has two strands, 
One of them is the leading strand, which will only need one RNA primer. Okay? The lagging strand, however, because of the orientation that it's in, that one's going to require many little RNA primers as that strand gets built. What I mean by an RNA primer is simply a few bases of RNA. And if you remember, three of those bases will be the same as DNA, A, G, and C. But one of them will be different, okay? So this RNA primer will have U instead of T, okay? Now, this is important to think about because now you have to ask yourself, after DNA synthesis has occurred, what's our problem now? Well, each of those new DNA strands have these little segments of RNA. And as we just mentioned, RNA has uracil in it and it doesn't have any thymine. So that's gonna be a problem, right? You don't have proper DNA code in those little segments. So the last part of DNA replication is to fix this problem. So what you need is pole one, RNASH, and ligase, okay? Pole one, RNASH, and ligase. So what happens here, pole one and RNASH will degrade the primers, okay? So these RNA primers get broken away and removed by PO1 and RNase H. Then what happens is PO1 also replaces the removed RNA with the DNA sequences, with DNA bases. Okay, so now with A's, T's, G's, and C's. And then the last step is ligase will seal any little gaps in the backbone, okay? So now at the end, you have beautifully repaired DNA that is 100% DNA, no more RNA present, okay? So just to review that process one more time, you have pole one and RNAs-H degrading primers. You then have pole one replacing those removed RNA bases with DNA bases, and ligase will simply seal up any of the gaps in the backbone, okay? So now in the next slide, what I'll do is review each of these enzymes with their function so that just in case you missed anything or had trouble writing it down on time, you'll have it to visualize and to take down in your notes. Okay, so let's recap that one more time. The way DNA replication works is, first you have the gyrase, and the gyrase uncoils that big ball of DNA. Then the helicase comes along, and that unzips the double strands, so that there are now two exposed single strands. Then SSB comes along and coats both of those single strands so that they don't instantly stick back together. Now that those strands are nice and separated, primase can come along, and that's the one that we said is a rock star. It's an RNA polymerase that will start off our new strands, but it's starting off as RNA bases, just a few, usually about six to nine bases. And now that those bases are there, DNA polymerase, which has its limitations, now has something to build off of as a starting point. So now DNA polymerase can take over and build the rest of the DNA strands, putting together those A's, T's, G's, and C's. Once that's complete and we have our two new DNA strands, there's currently a problem, right? After DNA synthesis, there's that problem that there are still some RNA bases in that DNA strand because the primers are there. So now, pole one 
and RNAsH will degrade or remove any of those RNA bases and PO1, which is a polymerase, will now build or replace those RNA bases with DNA bases. The last thing to happen is ligase basically cleans up the, the last minute messes and will reseal any little gaps that are currently in the backbone of the DNA. And boom, there you have the bacteria has two new DNA strands, which are semi-conservative. They are made up of one original DNA strand and one newly built DNA strand. And all of this occurred before mitosis, okay, before the cell needs to divide. So that after mitosis, each cell will have the proper amount of DNA, okay? If you have any trouble with any of the enzymes or any of the DNA replication process, just send me a remind message and I'll give you a bit more information. Again, this is meant as a chapter in microbiology that is supposed to be review, but I understand that some students may not have had this before. So feel free to ask as many questions as you like. You are never bothering me. Okay, so we're gonna skip ahead now and pretend that that cell has divided. Every cell now is completely happy with its proper amount of DNA. And now we have to think about what is that cell gonna do with the DNA that it has, right? How is it going to use that DNA? Now, if you think back to the central dogma, what's the DNA used for? It's used to code for RNA, okay? which means it gets expressed to build RNA. So now anytime you hear gene expression, think DNA coding for RNA and RNA being built. And then eventually that RNA will be used to make proteins. And we saw in lecture one, proteins are very important to cells. They do just about everything, okay? Now, just like we did with DNA replication, before we go into all of the scary details of the process, I'm first gonna show you a couple of animations that let you visualize a little bit of what's going on. Cells use DNA to store information while proteins are used to perform the activities necessary to keep the cell alive. In a process called transcription, the information stored in a DNA molecule is copied into RNA molecules, which can be used to synthesize specific proteins. Cells use three types of RNA, ribosomal RNA molecules, which are used to form ribosomes, transfer RNA molecules, which deliver amino acids to ribosomes, and messenger RNA molecules, which carry the information for making specific proteins from DNA to ribosomes. There are three stages in the process of transcription, initiation, elongation, and termination. Let's see how each stage works. During initiation, RNA polymerase binds to the DNA and recognizes a site called a promoter at the three prime end of the template strand of the target gene. When RNA polymerase binds a promoter, it breaks the hydrogen bonds holding the DNA strands together at the site of the promoter and transcription begins. RNA polymerase does not bind to all promoters with equal affinity. This difference in promoter strength is one way that cells can control gene expression. The more strongly RNA polymerase binds to a particular promoter, the more likely that gene is to be transcribed. In general, higher levels of transcription lead to higher levels of translation, which leads to higher concentrations of that polypeptide. One strand of the DNA serves as a template strand. The RNA transcript is copied from this strand of the gene and therefore has an
There are three stages in the process of transcription, initiation, elongation, and termination. Let's see how each stage works. During initiation, RNA polymerase binds to the DNA and recognizes a site called a promoter at the three prime end of the template strand of the target gene. When RNA polymerase binds a promoter, it breaks the hydrogen bonds holding the DNA strands together at the site of the promoter and transcription begins. RNA polymerase does not bind to all promoters with equal affinity. This difference in promoter strength is one way that cells can control gene expression. The more strongly RNA polymerase binds to a particular promoter, the more likely that gene is to be transcribed. In general, higher levels of transcription lead to higher levels of translation, which leads to higher concentrations of that polypeptide. One strand of the DNA serves as a template strand. The RNA transcript is copied from this strand of the gene and therefore has an RNA sequence complementary to the So as I said before, anytime you hear the term gene expression, that means transcription, okay? So that means going from DNA to RNA. Basically, you're building an RNA sequence using a DNA code, okay? And in a minute, we're, we're gonna practice how to do that, making you in charge of being able to build RNA just by looking at a DNA code. Now, when we talk about gene expression, most genes in a cell are constantly varying expression. So sometimes certain genes will be turned on, whereas other times they'll be turned off. So we usually say activated or repressed, because think about it, if all of the genes in a cell were active at the same time, can you imagine how much RNA would be produced? At, at, that cell would basically explode, right? So you only have genes active when they're needed. Now, there are some genes that are always active. We call these constitutive or housekeeping genes. So circle those terms, constitutive and housekeeping genes. They mean the same thing. They simply mean that a gene is always active, okay? So it's always being expressed. These are basically genes and products that would need for processes that are always occurring in a cell. So think of life processes such as, you know, genetic processes themselves, where you always need enzymes to be made for those processes. So for instance, polymerase genes, the genes for, that are responsible for ultimately making polymerases, those are always active because they're something that the cell will always need. Now, when we talk about DNA coding for RNA, there's actually all different types of RNA that's made. There's mRNA, rRNA, and tRNA. But the one that will ultimately encode for a protein is mRNA. So you're going to hear more about that in later slides. Now, keep in mind this process of gene expression. To express DNA, DNA is double-stranded, right? So those double strands are gonna need to separate just like we saw them do in DNA replication. Now, since DNA is double stranded, but it's coding for RNA, which is single stranded, you're gonna end up with different types of strands. You have the anti-sense strand of DNA and the coding sense strand, okay? Now, what you're gonna notice in this process, while RNA polymerase is building the RNA, these two strands of DNA have different roles because remember, since DNA is double-stranded and it's producing a single-stranded product of RNA, only one of those strands is going to be the template, okay? The template or code used to build that RNA, okay? so. In the next slide, I'm gonna demonstrate what this means, but for now, you can think of the coding strand or the sense strand as having the same sequence as RNA, except 
that of course DNA always has a T wherever RNA would have a U. So when you see sense strand, I want you to underline the S at the beginning of sense strand and write same. Okay, we're going to go over that again in the next slides, but I want you to start associating coding or sense with being the same code as RNA. Whereas the anti-sense strand of DNA is actually the strand that will be the template for building the RNA, which means that as the cell reads the anti-sense, it's going to pick the complements of that sequence to build the mRNA. So for anti-sense strand, you can make note that this will complement the RNA sequence. It will be anti it, so it won't be the same letters. It'll be the opposite or the complement, whereas the sense strand will be the same sequence. Okay, so we're going to visualize that now in the next slides because you have to be very comfortable with making RNA simply by looking at a DNA code the same way that a cell would. Okay, so to help you visualize the concept of the sense DNA versus the antisense DNA and how it relates to the RNA, let's think of it this way. Whenever you're given a DNA sequence, for instance, if you're doing any research and you look up DNA sequence online, you always find the sequence written out as a single strand in five prime to three prime direction. So when I say five prime, that's five prime to three prime direction. And like I mentioned earlier, that's basically just a label of orientation, kind of like saying left to right or top to bottom or even north versus south. Okay, so five prime and three prime is just the orientation of DNA. Now, when you find this sequence, you notice this is a single strand, right? But what do you know about DNA? DNA is double stranded. So even though you have this single strand, the DNA itself is actually two strands. And the second strand of DNA is always the complement of the first. Okay, and remember for complements, we previously said you can use the, the memory trick at Georgian court. The complement of A is T, the complement of G is C. Okay, now when we talk about five prime, three prime, those are the complements to each other. So the complement of five prime is three prime, and the complement of three prime is five prime. Okay, so you can kind of think of them as opposites whenever I say complement. So if our DNA sequence is five prime, C, A, C, G, G, C, three prime, then the second, the double strand of that DNA would be the complement. It would be the complement of five prime, which is three prime. The complement of C is G, A is T, G, C, C, G, five prime. Because again, each of these is the complement of the one we see above. So the complement of five prime is three prime. The complement of the C is G. Complement of A is T. Complement of C is G and so forth. Okay, right down to the very last number, the three prime complement is five prime. So now, if we're going to build an RNA strand from this, what if we say about any kind of polymerase? What direction do they always like to build in? Five prime to three prime, right? So our RNA, the RNA that is going to be made, you want it to be made in the five prime, three prime direction. How would you get an RNA sequence that's five prime to three prime? Well, from this complement, right? So this strand here has to be the template so that our final result is five prime to three prime, okay? So the way that you would do this is simply take the complement of each piece of this strand. 
So if we were to make RNA from this DNA, we would have to go step by step. Complement of three prime is five prime. The complement of G is C. The complement of T is A, G, C, C. Complement is G, G, C. And then again, the final complement is three prime to this. Now, when you look at this RNA strand that's been created in five prime to three prime, what do you notice? What does this look like? This looks like our very first sequence, right? That's C, A, C, C, A, C. And you notice the five prime and three prime orientation is the same. So this strand of DNA would be called the sense and this strand is the antisense. So you notice that the RNA has the same sequence as the sense strand of DNA, and it is anti or complementing our antisense. Okay, so now to kind of practice this a little bit more, okay, I'll have you do some practice problems. Okay, so to practice this concept a little bit more on sense versus anti-sense DNA and how to get the RNA that would be created during transcription, the way that you would encounter this as a question on an exam or whatnot is you'd first know whether you're given sense or anti-sense DNA, okay? And it would always be given to you in the five prime to three prime direction. So in our first bullet point, we're looking at sense DNA. And like I said before, as soon as you see sense DNA, look at that S and remember same. So when you're given a sense DNA sequence, your RNA should look identical to that. Same number, same letters everywhere, except since it's RNA now, any T should become a U, okay? So if we're given sense DNA, five prime, C, A, G, T, three prime, then we have to make the five prime to three prime RNA. Since this is sense DNA that we are given, our RNA should look the same. So it would be five prime, C, A, G, and then because it's RNA, U instead of T, and it continues to the three prime. Okay, so notice the DNA and the RNA look the same everywhere except for when you have a T in the DNA. Now it's a U. Other than that, it's the same. The other way you may encounter this is if you see antisense instead. And remember, the moment you see anti-sense, anti tells you that you should be complementing everything, including the numbers. So if you are given an anti-sense DNA sequence, that is five prime, C, A, G, T, three prime, then you go one by one and complement each of these, okay? So it's not gonna be the same number or letter anywhere. It's the complement. So when you ask yourself, what is the five prime to three prime RNA, right? Well, don't worry about orientation yet. First, simply complement everything, including the numbers. So the first thing you would do is instead of a five prime, the complement is now three prime. Then G instead of a C, the complement to A is U. C complements the G. A complements the T, and then five prime complements the three prime, okay? So for each number or letter, you're doing the opposite, the complement. Now, keep in mind, the question will always ask for the final answer to be written in five prime to three prime. So if you give me this, then you are currently incorrect because that is not the five prime to three prime RNA. So the last thing you always have to do is make sure to rewrite 
the final answer, five prime to three prime, simply reading this from right to left. So you'd write five prime A, C, U, G, three prime, just like you see here at the bottom of the slide. So five prime A, C, U, G, three prime, okay? So once again, anytime you're given sense DNA, you simply write the same numbers and letters exactly the way they are and replace any T's with U. If instead you're given antisense, then every single number or letter must be the complement and your final answer must be flipped around to be five prime to three prime. Okay, so I always recommend doing the antisense in two steps. That way you don't accidentally miss a letter or write anything incorrectly if you try to do it in one step. Okay, so now I want you to practice this concept because again this is something that students usually get some points off during the semester for. So I'm going to give you some extra practice now. The first practice problem is if a sense strand of 5 prime to 3 prime DNA is 5 prime A T C G A C 3 prime, then what is the 5 prime to 3 prime RNA synthesized during transcription? Okay, this is the exact format that you find this type of question on the exam or on the final as well. Okay, and if it's a multiple choice, then you would be given four different options. Otherwise, if it's part of an essay and you're explaining some sort of concept, then you would have to write out the answer on your own. Now, what I want you to do for this practice problem, as well as the one on the next slide, is to pre please send me your answer to this practice problem one and the practice problem two on the next slide in the Remind app by Saturday noon. Okay, so this goes toward your Remind app participation grade. Okay, so please send me practice problem one and the problem on the next slide. And that way I could help prevent you from having any issues when you encounter these types of questions on the actual exams or the final. So this is the second practice problem. Now you see the difference here is if you are given an antisense strand of five prime to three prime DNA and you have to make the five prime to three prime RNA. Again, please send me the answer to practice problem one and practice problem two in the Remind app by Saturday noon. If you have any questions or are having any difficulty as you're practicing, then simply ask me either in Remind or through email, whichever you're most comfortable with, and I'll help explain this concept a little bit more. So now, what you just did was basically you performed transcription by looking and reading a DNA sequence and then building the RNA based on that sequence. Okay, so you were just a cell performing transcription. Now we're going to go into the details, including some of the enzymes that are involved in the process. Keep in mind that the three steps that you'll hear as names in transcription, which are initiation, elongation, and termination, those are the same names that will be used for the steps in translation, but what's actually occurring at each of those stages is completely different in translation. So please be careful when you're studying or reviewing these materials that you don't mix up the initiation, elongation, or termination of transcription versus translation, because again, that's very common mistake that I see students make. Even students who know the material very, very well, it's very easy to mix up the different processes. So please, when you review, make sure you're keeping everything separate. So the first thing we have to look at is initiation. When we talk about transcription initiation, okay, there are two key players that you have to remember. There's the promoter, and there's the bacterial RNA polymerase, specifically the sigma subunit. Okay, the sigma subunit here, sigma subunit. 
that's the other key player in initiation. So when we talk about transcription, okay, the first thing in terms of initiation to look at is the promoter. Now next to that word promoter, I want you to bake a star and write that the promoter is a sequence on the DNA. Okay, it's on that DNA code. And that is the region that the RNA polymerase will recognize as a start and will bind to. Now, why is it important that the RNA polymerase is coming along, recognizing the DNA and binding there? Well, what does RNA polymerase do? Well, it's polymerase, so it builds nucleic acids. And since it's RNA polymerase, it's going to be building the new RNA strand. Okay, so keep in mind, every gene needs a promoter to be expressed. Otherwise, the RNA polymerase, which is what builds RNA, would never arrive. It would never know what genes to express. So the promoter is critical. And then the bacterial RNA polymerase that actually builds the RNA is critical. Now, there are two parts of the RNA polymerase, okay? Sigma will be for initiation, and the core will be for elongation. And there's a trick to remember what exactly each of these is doing. For sigma, I want you to write down, sigma sees the promoter. Sigma sees the promoter. Whereas the core constructs the RNA strand. Okay, so sigma sees the promoter, the core will then take over and actually construct the RNA strand. So just to make sure that you have the memory trick written down in your notes, I've written it on this extra slide here. So sigma sees the promoter, and so it starts transcription. That's part of initiation. So whenever you're asked about initiation of transcription, remember, sigma subunit of the RNA polymerase and the promoter. Okay, those are the two things involved in initiation of transcription. Whereas elongation, core constructs the new RNA strand, and that is elongation. So to summarize that initiation and elongation in just a little bit more detail, okay, this is basically what you did before when we were dealing with sense and antisense. So there's a transcription bubble, which is in this figure down here, this bubble here, this opening of the double strands of DNA. And what happens is sigma subunit sees the promoter and binds, okay? This tells the RNA polymerase, okay, this is where we need to start. The RNA polymerase core enzyme then opens up the DNA, and there are about six to nine bases synthesized at the promoter region. So six to nine bases of RNA synthesized. Once this startup has occurred, the sigma subunit's no longer needed because it was just for initiation, for you know recognizing this gene that needed to be expressed and starting the process. Now that it's not needed anymore, the sigma subunit detaches or breaks away so that it can go help start other genes, right? Because we said there are tons of genes that get expressed every day at every moment. So now once sigma leaves, the core takes over and what does the core do? Core constructs. So the core subunit then goes along the DNA strand and one by one picks the complement of that DNA to build the new RNA. Okay, so it's adding bases together that complement the DNA, but uh, remember this is RNA that it's building, so you'll always have a uracil wherever there was a thymine. Now, this core enzyme picking base by base the complement of that DNA template strand, that's exactly what you did before. You were the core enzyme constructing that RNA from the DNA template. And now one more question for you. What do we call that DNA template strand? 
if it's the template and we're picking the complementary bases, then that's the anti-sense, okay? So keep that in mind. Whenever you see the term DNA template strand, that's the anti-sense because we're doing complementary bases here. Okay? So once again, elongation um, is the core subunit. And to recap this process, initiation and elongation is simply sigma subunit of RNA polymerase recognizing a promoter, helping to open up that area. There's six to nine bases put together, and then the sigma leaves and the core takes over constructing the new RNA. Now, for everything, there must be an ending, right? You can't just have endless long RNA strands made. There has to be a termination or a stop. For transcription, what the termination is, is a hairpin structure. So basically every RNA that's built at the end of it will have a complementary sequence that builds this hairpin loop structure. And if you picture a polymerase coming along, coming along, building RNA, boom, once this structure is formed, it's very destabilizing. It's like having a wall. Look at that wall right there. So now the polymerase will pop off. And if the polymerase pops off and leaves, what does that mean? Transcription is done because the polymerase is what's building a new RNA sequence. Okay, so if we think about the stages of transcription, Initiation is sigma seeing the promoter and starting the process. Initiation is the core constructing the RNA. And then this all terminates when a hairpin loop is formed and destabilizes the polymerase so that it pops off the RNA and the process is done. Now keep in mind, that when RNA is being made, it is not just mRNA that's made, but tRNA and rRNA also has to be made. And you have to know the function of each of these different types of RNA. Okay, so when you have mRNA, that's the message or the blueprint code that the protein is going to be made from. And then you have tRNA and rRNA. tRNA is transfer RNA. That's responsible for holding the amino acids that are going to be put together to make a protein. And then rRNA is ribosomal RNA, which is part of the ribosome, which is the structure, the big enzyme structure that will make the protein. Okay, And all of these RNA, like I show in the slide, have their role in the process of translation. And when you hear translation, Keep in mind, that's going to be making protein from an RNA code. So before we get into the details of translation, let's just remind ourselves of some important facts. So first of all, whenever you hear translation, again, you're going from nucleic acid to protein. So the end part of the central dogma, because the central dogma we said is DNA to RNA to protein. You also have to remember, like I was just saying, all of the different types of RNA that'll be involved in this process. So you have mRNA, which is the blueprint. Okay, it's kind of like when we talked about antisense DNA and transcription. So mRNA is the blueprint sequence that we're gonna make the protein from. rRNA is part of the ribosome. Okay, this will be very, very important to the ribosome having this piece of rRNA because it's a little single strand of nucleic acid. And what do single strands of nucleic acids like to do? They're single, so they always wanna find that partner, right? They're very clingy, looking for their partner. So by having the piece of rRNA on the ribosome, this is gonna allow the ribosome to grab a hold of mRNA which is the code that it's gonna make protein from, okay? 
There's also tRNA, which is going to be what's holding each amino acid that's going to be put together to build the protein. Now, the two terms I want you to be able to recognize when we talk about tRNA is charged tRNA versus uncharged tRNA. Whenever you hear charged tRNA, that simply means that that tRNA is currently holding an amino acid. If it's uncharged, what do you think that means? It's lost that amino acid, right? It's no longer holding an amino acid. Okay, so charged tRNA is holding an amino acid. Uncharged tRNA has no amino acid. It's not holding anything at this point. Okay. The other thing that's important to know is the various parts of the ribosome. Okay, so this structure here is the ribosome, which is where proteins are going to be built. And there's three seats on it. Okay, remember when we first talked about enzymes in the last lecture, and we showed them as seats, basically. So you could picture the ribosome is the same way. It has three seats on it, which you can remember as EPA, or in the opposite direction, APE. Okay, and each of these seats I always want you to think about what's going on at this site, okay, at this. So A stands for amino acyl or acceptor site, okay. Basically, this is the site that a tRNA holding a single amino acid will enter the ribosome and sit there first, okay. The second seat, the peptidyl or P site T seat, is the peptide site, in the P site, the tRNA there will have a growing peptide string attached to it, meaning the growing protein. Okay, the tRNA sitting there will be holding the growing protein. And then E is the exit site. So after the tRNAs have given up their amino acids to continue building the big protein that's getting built, they'll now be uncharged and empty, and they can exit the E site, okay? This will become a little more clear when we go over the video in a couple of slides, and I go through the whole process in more detail, but I just want you to get uh, start getting familiar with the different sites and what kind of tRNA you'll find at each site, because this will help you understand the process in a minute. Okay, so this slide is just in case you didn't catch everything that I was saying on the last slide, and so that you can write it in your notes clearly. Okay, we have the A site, the P site, and the E site. And again, little tricks for, for helping you to remember what's going on at each one. Think of those letters, okay? A, amino acid, P, growing protein, peptide, whereas E is the exit and empty tRNA, okay? So we'll go into more detail with this in a few slides. But first, we need to review some other material dealing with proteins. So before you can actually build a protein, you have to ask yourself, what exactly is a protein? What's it made of? And if you remember from last time, the building blocks of these proteins are amino acids. There are 20 amino acids, and no, I'm not going to make you memorize every single one in this lovely little chart here. You can save that for biochem if you ever end up taking that class. Uh, then you have to actually draw those out. I'm not that mean, though. So for the 20 amino acids, the main thing I want you to know is, first of all, they're made up of an alpha carbon, which is the central carbon here. They then have an amine group, which is this NH2, a carboxyl group, which is COOH, a hydrogen atom, and then most significant of all is the R group. And the concept of the R group is what I really want you to remember about amino acids. So each amino acid, you'll notice here, each amino acid has a different R group, which is highlighted in blue. Okay, the R group is what makes that amino acid special or significant, okay? What's so important about these R groups is that they can have different properties. 
So for instance, an R group might be nonpolar or polar. It might be charged negatively or charged positively. Okay? It might be aromatic, which is called a big bulky benzene circle, a big bulky ring. All of that matters with proteins because remember, structure defines function. So depending on what R groups this protein has because of the amino acids will help determine how it folds and how it interacts with other proteins or other structures in the cell. So the R group is very significant. So again, you don't have to memorize all of these different amino acids, but I want you to know why the R groups are significant, which is that these R groups determine how that protein will fold or interact. So for instance, to be able to give an example, if a protein has a lot of amino acids that are negatively charged, what will that mean for that protein? Well, if they're negatively charged, opposites attract. So they will constantly attract or fold toward positively charged amino acids. What will they like to avoid? Other negative charges. Okay, so that charge will affect how it folds and interacts with others because it will want to attract positive charges and repel other negatives. If, for instance, a protein instead has a whole bunch of aromatic R groups, well, now that protein is going to be very bulky, not fold as well, and maybe not be able to get into certain channels or pores or parts of a cell. Okay. And the last concept is polar versus nonpolar. What do you know about polar? Where have you seen that before? Water. Water is polar, and so anything that's polar is hydrophilic. So proteins with a lot of these guys here, the polar R groups, they're going to want to fold or interact with water, whereas nonpolar will want to avoid water fold away from it, hide themselves. Okay, so understanding the significance of the R groups is very important. And being able to give examples of this is also important. Okay. And then the last thing to mention in terms of amino acids is they are joined by peptide bonds. Okay, and anytime you see peptide, that's just another word for protein. Now, when we are building proteins, it's going based on the genetic code, okay? the genetic code in which each amino acid is coded by three bases or a codon of the mRNA. So this little chart here gives you examples of all of the different codons you might find on RNA and the corresponding amino acid for that codon. Okay? So all of these are amino acids as well as three stop codons, okay? Now, when you look at these, okay, these various things, you have anticodons on one end of a tRNA and an amino acid on the other. So basically the idea is an anticodon is the complement or the match of the codon sequence, okay? So this would be the codon on the mRNA and then the anticodon would be the complement that matches this, and that tRNA is holding a, an amino acid okay, to bring over to build that protein. Now what you'll notice is there are 64 codons, including the three stop codons, but what did we say before? There are only 20 amino acids. So what that means is the genetic code is what we call degenerative. You'll notice that a lot of the different codons will code for the same amino acid. So for instance here, look at all of these codons that code for leucine, okay? Because there are 64 possibilities for codons, but only 20 amino acids to be made. So to help you visualize what I was just saying about tRNA and mRNA and what exactly codons are and the anticodons with the genetic code, 
um, I drew out what you can draw in your notes, which is we have our mRNA down here. Now, normally this would be a huge sequence of many, many different uh, nitrogen bases, but we're just going to show a single codon. So the letters, the nitrogen bases on the mRNA is the codon. tRNA then comes along and it has the matching anticodon, which allows it to stay over here with this codon. And on the other side, it is holding an amino acid. So in this case, it is holding alanine, one of the amino acids. Okay, so just to help you visualize that tRNA is the one with the anticodon on one end of it and an amino acid on the other. And then mRNA is down here with the sequence that tells the tRNA where exactly it's bringing this amino acid alanine. Okay, so you'll get to see this more in the video when we go over the exact process of translation. But this is just to help you visualize codon versus anticodon. Now, when we say that proteins will be synthesized, the structure that's responsible for that, where it's going to be occurring, is the ribosome. And the ribosome is made up of RNA and proteins. So we call it a nucleoprotein. And specifically, the RNA that it is made up of is that rRNA that I mentioned earlier. So as you see here, rRNA, okay? The role of the ribosome is to synthesize proteins, which you'll get to see in the video that I'm going to show in a couple of slides. Now, what's very important on this slide is the term nucleoprotein. I want you to circle, star, highlight that word, because if you break down that word, it tells you that this structure has both nucleic acid and it has protein. Now, what's important about that, the protein side of it allows it to have enzyme activity. So it allows it to, you know, be involved in reactions. The nucleic acid is important because like we mentioned earlier, the fact that this structure has a small piece of single rRNA means that the single nucleic acid single wants to find its partner it's going to be sticky right that rna of the the nucleoprotein is going to allow the ribosome to grab the mrna and to actually start synthesizing proteins okay so the fact that it's a nucleoprotein is very important it allows it to bind mrna so now we're going to go into the exact process of translation and just like we talked about with transcription, there's initiation, there's going to be elongation, and there's going to be termination. So now starting translation, that's going to be initiation, okay? The very early portion of mRNA, so in the figure here, this portion here, this is not going to be translated. It's not going to code for any amino acids or any part of the protein. Okay, instead, it's just part of the initiation. Now, that means that the ribosome is going to have to, you know, search and find the start codon. In order to do that, first of all, for initiation, it's going to need a ribosome binding site, meaning the mRNA has to have what's called the Schindel-Garno sequence. So that's highlighted in green over here. Ag agu, you can call it. A G G A G G U. So this Schindel Garno sequence on the mRNA is important for initiation because it's the complement of the rRNA of the ribosome. So remember, we said that the ribosome, because it's a nucleoprotein and has rRNA, it could grab a hold of the mRNA. The way that it does that is by complementing the Schindel Garno. Okay, so put little stars around Schindel Garno in your notes because that's critical for initiation. The mRNA Schindel Garno sequence has to be grabbed by the ribosome's rRNA. Okay. There's also the other part of initiation, which is the initiator tRNA. Okay, that 
that means that there will be the very first tRNA that comes to the ribosome to start this process will always be holding F-met, which simply means the amino acid called methionine, okay? Even though it says formal methionine, that's just because it's bacteria. In humans, all of your proteins also start with methionine, but without the formal in front of it, okay? That's just a chemical symbol. So now, when you think of this um, tRNA that's holding methionine, it's going to bind AUG as the start codon in the PSEC. Now, you're about to see this process in a video to help you visualize what's going on. But I first want to give you an idea of what, you know, kind of our summary of what's happening in the video and in this process, okay? So when you have translation occurring, the first thing that's going to happen is the ribosome has to grab a hold of the shine delgarno of the mRNA. So now it's holding on to that mRNA so that it can start reading the sequence and picking what amino acids go where to build the new protein, right? So what happens with initiation, if you remember our ribosome has all of those seats we talked about, the APE, A-P-E sites. Okay, so after the ribosome has grabbed a hold of the shell, shine del garno, then we're gonna look for the initiator tRNA. The initiator tRNA holding FMET is going to be the only tRNA that enters the ribosome at the P site. Every other tRNA enters at the A acceptor site, okay? So the tRNA holding FMET will enter and sit on the P site. A second tRNA then holding a different amino acid will come in and it will sit on the A, the acceptor site. Then I want you to make the sound pa, pa. Think of pa, okay? Pa will help you visualize that the amino acids that's being held by the tRNA in the P site is then cut and attaches to the amino acid in the tRNA in the A site. So the transfer is pa from the P site to the A site. Okay, so the tRNA holding amino acids in the P site will give up whatever amino acids it's holding to the tRNA that's in the A site. Once this happens now, the ribosome will have a dramatic conformational change and it's going to shift. And after it shifts, everyone should be on the right seat. So after the shift, the empty tRNA, the uncharged tRNA that gave up its amino acid is now going to be in the E, empty site. The tRNA that's holding the growing polypeptide, which just gained amino acids, that will be sitting in the P site now. And lastly, the A site will now be empty and it'll be able to accept the next tRNA holding a single amino acid to do this all over again. So now the next TRA, tRNA holding an amino acid will come in at the acceptor site, the A site. The P site tRNA will go pop, transfer what it's holding to the A site, and then the ribosome will shift again. The tRNA that gave away everything will be empty on the E site and leave. The tRNA that gained amino acids will be the growing polypeptide in the P site, and the A site will now be open so that the next tRNA holding a single amino acid can come in and pop, can keep happening, pop, 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 okay? So the video you're now going to see will show you that process, okay? It's basically showing you the elongation stage. So it's leaving out the initiation stage, which was Shine Delgarno and FMET, and it's going straight to elongation to show you what happens. Okay, so like I said, this video will show you elongation of the growing protein.
To extend a growing polypeptide chain, the ribosome must select the correct amino acids that are specified by the messenger RNA. An amino acyl tRNA bound to elongation factor TU, EFTU for short, enters the free A site on the ribosome. If the anticodon of the charged tRNA does not match the codon in the messenger RNA, the tRNA is rejected. The process of trial and error repeats until the correct tRNA is identified. Elongation factor TU hydrolyzes its bound GTP and dissociates. If the tRNA is correctly matched and remains bound for a long enough time, it is committed to be used in protein synthesis. The ribosome catalyzes the formation of the new peptide bond and undergoes a dramatic conformational that change. That was just pa. Elongation factor G binds to the ribosome. Hydrolysis of GTP by elongation factor G switches the ribosome back to the state in which it can accept the next incoming tRNA. Okay, so you don't have to remember all of the GTP, GDP, elongation factor. I just want you to remember and be able to explain the initiation process, which we mentioned was the Scheindel Garno and the FMET information, and then be able to explain how the transfer is occurring. So the idea of the single amino acid holding tRNA coming into the A site, the transfer is from P to A, in the end where each of those tRNAs is ending up. Okay, so I'm going to write out some notes for you to write down on the next slide. So as I mentioned, here are the notes you should write down to recap initiation and elongation of translation. You can pause the video so that you have enough time to write everything down and make sure to put little stars or uh, highlight the information on this page as it will be very important and we'll come back again. Okay, so now as we saw with transcription, everything has to come to an end. So for every process, you need some way to terminate it so that the cell doesn't basically just fill up with product and boom, explode. Okay, so with translation, the way termination occurs is there are three possible stop codons, okay, from the genetic code. And what's very important is that there is no tRNA that can read these codons, meaning no tRNA has the anticodon to match to bind to these stop codons. Now, what that tells you is, if no tRNA can come to this codon, then what happens to the process? Well, no tRNA means no next amino acid, which means the process is going to end. Now, instead of tRNA being able to read these codons, release factor protein reads these stop codons, meaning RF or release factor protein is the only protein that can bind at this location and when it does it triggers this event of peptidyl transferase now breaking apart or taking away the final protein and the rest of the ribosome is broken apart to be recycled so that it can go elsewhere and help um, basically conserve resources and help synthesize proteins for the next batch. Now, again, what I really want to emphasize on this slide is the concept of release factor protein. Put little stars there that release factor protein is the only thing that is going to bind to stop codons, that no tRNA will bind to these stop codons, okay? And then the process is over and you now have a nice new protein. Now, one other thing I wanna mention about transcription and translation before we move on to mutations and wrap up this lecture is the idea of couple transcription translation, okay? This is something that can only happen in prokaryotes and not in eukaryotes. 
Now, to help kind of answer why this is only possible in prokaryotes and not in eukaryotes, you have to remind yourself, what exactly does prokaryote mean versus eukaryote? So prokaryote, pro, no. Prokaryote means no nucleus, no internal membranes, whereas eukaryotes have that. So now, when we say coupled transcription translation, we mean that bacteria and prokaryotes, they can have the mRNA start to get translated. So if you look at the figure, you see ribosomes jumping on that mRNA before it's even finished synthesizing from dRNA, if, sorry, from DNA. So that shows you that you have both processes occurring at once. More RNA is being made, and right away, proteins are being made from that RNA, which is not even finished being made. Why is this not possible in eukaryotes? Very important question. Circle, star, highlight that. It's because eukaryotes have a nucleus, okay? Nucleus and internal membranes. That means that the DNA and the RNA is separate from the ribosomes, okay? So in bacteria, everything's mixed together in the cytoplasm. So DNA and RNA are doing their thing and ribosomes can jump on. In eukaryotes, they're separated by the nucleus. So that means that the RNA has to finish getting synthesized or transcribed from DNA, and then it has to exit the nucleus and go to the ribosomes and then translate proteins. Okay, so why is this not possible in eukaryotes? The answer is because the nucleus separates the DNA RNA from the ribosomes. So now the last part of this lecture, what we want to go through rather briefly compared to, you know, in a genetics course where there, there would be a lot of things we talk about here. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about is the fact that sometimes things go wrong with DNA, okay, especially during the replication process. And what do you call it when something goes wrong with DNA? It's called a mutation. Okay, mutations are a change in a cell's genetic material, meaning a change in their DNA sequence, in their code. Now, most mutations are neutral and you never even notice they occur, but there are harmful ones. And even though they're rare, they're more noticeable because of the fact that, you know, they're so detrimental. Now, they are rare because they tend not to carry on. Think about it. If a mutation is really bad and it kills an organism early, so for instance, sometimes it will kill uh, an organism before it even gets a chance to be born. Well, if it's killing that organism early, that organism doesn't get a chance to reproduce, so that mutation doesn't get passed on. Okay. Plus, if you think about genetics, you always have two alleles for each gene, right? Because you have one allele from mom, one allele from dad. So even if you have a harmful mutation in one, you usually have a second copy to then make up for that. Now, there are also some beneficial mutations, and these get evolutionarily maintained. What that means is, if it's beneficial, then it's gonna increase the chances of that organism surviving. And if that organism survives, what do they have a better chance of doing? Reproducing. So now if they reproduce, then that mutation will get passed on. But keep in mind, it's only passed down if it is in the germline. And what's germline mean? It's a fancy way of saying they're gametes, meaning they're sex cells. So for instance, sperm or egg. Now there are a whole bunch of different types of mutations. Some of the major ones are base substitutions, insertions, deletions, inversions, duplications, and translocations. The ones that we'll focus on or that I want you to circle are base substitutions, 
insertions and deletions. Okay, just to briefly summarize what each of these things are before we go into the details of some of the more significant ones. Uh, base substitution simply means that in the DNA sequence, one nitrogen base has been replaced with another. Okay, so that means one of those four letters, the A, T, G, or C, has been replaced by another. So for instance, you're supposed to have a G somewhere and suddenly it's a T. Okay, insertion means that one of the bases has been added into the DNA sequence. So if the sequence is supposed to be C, A, C, well now maybe it's C, A, T, C. A deletion is exactly what it sounds like. One or more bases have now been removed from the DNA sequence. So for instance, if it was supposed to be CAC and now it's CC, okay? Inversion means that the segment of DNA has stayed in the same location but has flipped. So for instance, if it was supposed to be a sequence of CAT, now it's TAC. Duplication is exactly what it sounds like. You end up with multiple copies of the same little piece of DNA. So for instance, for that same example of CAT, well now it's CAT, CAT, CAT. And sometimes that can be good if, you know, if that produces a very valuable protein and now you have more of it, but sometimes that's bad where you don't want a lot of something. The last one here is translocation which location, location, location in the name means that it has moved to a different location in the DNA. So a piece of the sequence is now not where it's supposed to be, it's somewhere else. But like I said, we're gonna focus on base substitutions, insertions, and deletions. So for base substitution, there's a few different terms that I want you to know. With base substitution, the first option is a missense mutation. Okay, so circle the word missense mutation. What this means is that a single nucleotide, so that means an A, T, G, or C, has been changed. And now when transcription and then translation occurs of that sequence, there's now a different amino acid than was supposed to be in the final protein product. Okay, this missense mutation can either be conservative or radical. So the way I like to explain it to students, the difference between these two, is I first like you to think of radical. What does the word radical mean in English? Radical is very different, right? So a radical substitution or radical replacement means that if that original amino acid was supposed to have a particular chemical property, such as a positive charge, well, now it has a different chemical property, such as a negative charge. Why is that significant? What do you know about the charges of these amino acids? Remember, we talked about the R groups. We said that these charges affect how that protein will fold. So now with the radical replacement, there is going to be a difference in folding and a difference in interactions. Because if that protein was supposed to have a more positive charge, now it's negative. Well, now it's going to interact differently. The original would have been attracted, if it's positive, would have been attracted to negatives and would have repelled positives. Now the complete opposite occurs, okay? So if that's radical, then what do you think conservative is? Conservative means not much of a change. So yes, there will be a different protein as you see in this figure here. So for instance, there was supposed to be an alanine, mutation happens, now it's a glycine instead, but these two have very similar chemical properties. So the way the protein actually folds and interacts is gonna be the same, even though there's a different amino acid there. So that's a conservative substitution. And if we go based on the charges we were talking about before, if let's say the original protein was supposed to be a positive charge, if a conservative substitution occurs, 
the new amino acid will also have a positive charge. So again, the protein will fold and interact the way that it's intended. Okay, so make sure you understand the meaning of missense mutation, conservative substitution, and radical replacement. So missense means there's a different amino acid now. Conservative specifies that that new amino acid is very similar to the original. Same charge, for instance. Radical means the new amino acid is very different. So for instance, a different charge than the original. The other possible base substitution is a nonsense mutation. And what I do for this one is I shout at the students, stop the nonsense. Okay, when you hear nonsense mutation, think stop the nonsense. Because what happens with this one, the new sequence change leads to a stop codon instead of an amino acid. Okay, so a missense mutation led to a different amino acid. A nonsense mutation leads to a stop codon. And what does a stop codon do? It terminates translation, which means that once that DNA sequence gets transcribed and translated, the protein is going to end early. So now it'll be shortened, which we call a truncated protein. And this short protein, one of two things can happen. If it's shortened, well, now it's not going to do its proper job in the cell, right? Structure defines function. So you may not have that function occurring, or it may mess things up, kind of picture it getting stuck where it shouldn't or kind of, you know, interfering with things. Or what usually happens is the cell will detect a truncated protein, a short protein, and it will label it for degradation. It gets chopped up. Okay, proteolysis, right? Chopping up proteins. So now you're thinking, well, we got rid of the mistake. So that's good, right? Wrong. What's the problem? The problem is you don't have the protein you intended. Okay, so yes, you got rid of the mutant protein, but you still don't have the product that you wanted or you needed at that moment. So a nonsense mutation can be quite an issue. But again, make sure you're comfortable with the difference between missense mutation and nonsense mutation. The next point I want to make when it comes to mutations is that the severity or the issues with mutations depends on the number of bases affected, especially when it comes to insertion and deletion mutations because mutations can affect the, free, the reading frame. And as we know, sequences are read as codons, okay, sets of three. So if a, a change, let's say insertion or deletion, is not a set of three, so for instance, it's only one or two bases, then when the cell goes to read that sequence and it's reading in sets of three, Everything after that mutation is going to be messed up, will be a different code, different amino acids, completely read wrong. Now that is called a frame shift. Okay, so if a mutation occurs, you hope that it occurs as a set of three, because if it is not, not a set of three, then you end up with a frame shift and everything is messed up after that point. The last thing that I want to mention for this lecture and for mutation specifically is the term mutagens. Anytime that you hear something is a mutagen, it means that it can cause a genetic mutation. These agents or items can be chemical or radiation as most people think of, but they can also be microbes, okay? Microbes such as HPV or H. pylori, for instance, and even the, the um, Epstein-Barr virus, which most people think of as causing mono, all of these have been found to be mutagens, meaning they cause genetic mutations and thus can cause cancer. Okay, so I want you to put little stars around HPV, 
and H. pylori, especially HPV, because we're going to talk about that a lot in later lectures, okay, to remind yourself that not just, you know, common things like radiation and chemicals that people fear for causing cancer, but also microbes can cause cancer. So be very careful about infections and your exposure to these things. You know, a lot of them are preventable, especially the sexually transmitted infections like HPV. And HPV has now become the leading cause of cervical cancer, throat and mouth cancer, and rectal cancer. A lot of people are now dying from this infection down the line, okay, because it stays within you. So please keep in mind that not just UV or cigarette smoke or chemicals can be mutagens, but also microbes such as HPV. Well, as you know, at the end of each lecture, it's time to go to that discussion board and please work on our study exercises. Make sure to post and to read other posts as well, okay? This will help a lot as we get closer to the exam because keep in mind the first exam is only on lectures one and two because I know that these lectures have a lot more information than some of the other lectures and I know that the genetics chapter which we just covered can be very difficult. So I keep the exam on these two lectures rather than throwing extra information at you. So please pay close attention to the discussion board and please make sure to send me your remind answers to the questions that I posed in this slide, these slides, um, particularly problem one and two, with regard to antisense and sense DNA making the RNA. Okay? As always, if you have any questions or any issues with any of the slides or with the technology on Blackboard, simply send me a message on remind or through email. Thank you so much.